on civil, we have uh, several bills on the calendar. Uh, Chairman Rice asked us to postpone consideration of House Bill 205. We're going to go ahead and do that next Wednesday, as the plan is at this minute. Uh, Representative Chandler has asked us to hold off on consideration of House Bill 744 today. Um, and so we will uh, certainly comply with that request. Um, I know, uh, Mr. Raffensperger, I know you've got another meeting, so we'll go ahead and call House Bill 790 if you're ready. And before we get going, let me uh, recognize uh, our judge of the day or judge of the week. I'm not sure how it's working these days, Judge Gunner. Great to see you. Week, month, whatever it may be. Judge, thank you very much for being here. Yes, sir. Thank you for being a resource to the committee and to the General Assembly. Mr. Raffensperger, you're up. You're up. And then uh, Chairman Sessler, you're on deck with 845. This on? Yeah, let's make sure we got the good – pull that a little more toward you. Are we good? Yeah, we're good. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, overview of HB 790, uh, I would call this the anti-swatting bill. And this really came about uh, uh, Detective Sergeant Finley from the Johns Creek Police Department uh, asked me if I would uh, move forward on a bill on this. What it, this bill would do is increase the penalties for swatting. Swatting is making a hoax 911 call. But it's more than just a hoax 911 call. People are disguising where they're calling from. And what happened in Johns Creek two years ago, I was actually still on council at the time, was that someone disguised uh, that it, they thought they were calling from a home in Country Club of the South. He was actually calling from Canada. Uh, so what we've seen is an escalation because SWAT is called. Uh, this person said that he had killed three people, and then he was demanding a $30,000 ransom. SWAT descends on the home. And these uh, kids and the nanny that was there were absolutely terrified. Uh, people have been killed with hoax 911 calls. What this bill would do would increase the penalties uh, for up to uh, 10 years and also a fine of up to $100,000. Uh, according to code, uh, up to 10 years, uh, you can or the judge would have discretion to treat that as a misdemeanor instead of, you know, a felony uh, out and outright. So there is some. Uh, sentencing uh, discretion for a judge and then uh, also the penalty you know can ramp up to up to a hundred thousand dollars I did send this bill out the initial bill uh, to several people uh, in the delegate in uh, house members to get their feedback and one of the takebacks was well what about little Johnny innocent little Johnny didn't realize that and the judge would have sentencing sensing discretion but in the case of what we saw in Johns Creek and what we see nationwide, it's not innocent little Johnny. It's uh, it's a very malicious and dangerous prank. So I would ask for your favorable uh, consideration. Let me uh, ask for a report from uh, the subcommittee chair, Vice Chairman Pack. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, at the subcommittee level, we had two hearings on this. Um, this bill, um, there was testimony about how serious this problem is and disruption and, and waste of resources to law enforcement. And obviously there is a, a need to deter this type of conduct. But at the same time, we recognize that um, because of jurisdictional limitations, the actual enforcement might be a little bit of a challenge. But without having a statute on the books that covers a situation like this, uh, the prosecution may never happen. But we do believe that this is a um, a good uh, start and good foundation in Georgia law to start enforcing these to deter uh, bad actors, and it passed out of the committee unanimously. I thank the vice chair for his report. Uh, questions for the author, Ms. Tritower. Can you uh, expound just a little bit, and I, I was not on the subcommittee meetings. Um, just you and I kind of talked about before. When and I know that you're saying that you know this isn't you know little Johnny making a mistake. Uh, these are people that typically that are out to do this uh, maliciously or for enjoyment of doing a, a prank and watch people suffer from it. But the way that we go straight from this straight to felony, and everybody that knows me, I'm I'm a little cautious just to jump in straight into the felony world. Is that what we're doing? No, we aren't. Uh, we'd actually have the judge. Uh, well really have the discretion when he gets down to sentencing because if you look at the code and I can pull out the section but for any uh, uh, punishment 10 years or less that that can then be treated as a misdemeanor and that's in uh, code section 
I have it here, 17-10-5. When a defendant is found guilty of a felony punishable by imprisonment for a maximum term of 10 years or less, the judge may, in his discretion, impose punishment as for a misdemeanor. Yeah, he could impose punishment as for a misdemeanor, but the person's still going to be convicted as a felon. So their, their title will still be a convicted felon. So all that says is that the judge has discretion to, the sentencing could be that of a misdemeanor sentence. In other words, you could fine them $1,000, put them 12 months on probation, so you could lower it down is really what you're saying. But the person, once convicted, will be a felon. And that that's my holdup, and that's, that's going to continue. For me personally, that's going to continue to be my holdup. I, I, I am totally okay with what you're trying to do, but I think for this, and I understand the waste of resources, but for me, it, it, that, first, that first bite of the apple, I, I think it needs to be a misdemeanor. And then your second time, you've already had, and even if you want to make it a high and aggravated misdemeanor, fine. But I, but I think it needs to be a misdemeanor on the first go round, and then the second time, make it a felony. Because if the person didn't learn from their first go round, make it a felony. And I'm okay with that. But I just, and I, and I do know what you're trying to do, and I, and I agree with what you're trying to do. But for me, I'm always going to be hesitant, especially on things like this, when I know there's going to be, it's just going to be a matter of time. You're going to catch some kids that are messing around, that are just trying to poke fun. They really aren't bad kids. They don't really realize the gravity of what they're doing. They're going to do this. And they're going to be felons. We're going to convict them as a felon. And that's my concern. I appreciate your concern. Uh, it's written as it's written. If, if you're, it stands on its own merits, rise or fall. Are you, are you open to an amendment to make this start off with a misdemeanor? And then go, even if, it's high, even if we do a high and aggravated misdemeanor, and then step it up to a felony upon second conviction? If that would be the will of the uh, committee. Would you fa seem, see that as a friendly amendment, or would you oppose it? I would not oppose it. Mr. Trammell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, to the author of the bill, the question is about lines 38 and 39. And my question is, what work does that provision do? It seems like you would capture the scenarios that you're worried about in subpart 1 and subpart 2. So I'm curious about what incident would not be covered in one and two that you would want to cover that you would need three for. Uh, legislative council added that, but really, it's 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 one of those things. It's I don't say it's a catch-all, but uh, you try and anticipate everything you, that could possibly happen, and something else pops up. So. That's why it was added. Well, Mr. Chairman, if I could just ask a, sure. a follow-up just to sure. get, get to your, you know, just want to make sure I understand the intent and try to get legislation that reaches that but doesn't open up um, the statute so that it goes beyond that. So your, your concern is threat to life, basically either by a weapon or a bomb or – is that right? Correct. It's where uh, – a call is made, a, a threat is made of such a significant nature that uh, SWAT is called out or uh, really a, a heightened police response because not every uh, police jurisdiction in the state of Georgia has SWAT. So if you get into these rural areas, uh, they don't have a SWAT team, whereas obviously uh, City of Johns Creek and other areas do. But yes. In, in same, a similar question to what Representative Hightower asked, would you entertain an amendment um, to remove that language, do you, do you have trouble removing that, 38 and 39? I mean, it, it, in, just to be plain, it seems like what you're describing is captured by 1 and 2, and the concern that I would have is that 3 opens the door to practically anything a 911, a false 911 call would involve. Representative, uh, this is when I will f fall back on the uh, wisdom of the committee. Uh, I am not an attorney. I'm an engineer, 
and I'm a person that's concerned for something that happened in my city. And so therefore, I would defer to the wisdom you know, of y'all because um, you've been educated in the law, and I want to do what is appropriate. And I just believe that um, I thought this was a great step in that. And uh, um, I look forward to, if, a, if an amendment is offered, I look forward to looking at it. Mr. Reeves. I just wanted to respond to um, some of Representative Hightower's comments on this. And um, Representative Hightower and I were discussing this morning how it is oftentimes impossible to to carve out or create perfect policy. And that what I want to remind the committee of and, and also with Representative Hightower, we, to a certain degree, we do what we do, but there's always discretion at the other end of the policy that we make. And with a situation like this, if the person accused does fit the scenario that we're talking about, I think it's important to remember that the district attorney's office has options such as diversion programs and other ways that those situations can be accounted for um, without diminishing the, the ability to capture the, the very serious incidents that are occurring um, in a way other than a misdemeanor for you know the first offense which you know, whether it's the first second or third it's very this is a very serious situation the DA has the ability to maneuver a case through a, a diversion program or other charges in a way to account for these less serious situations and I understand that then that, that we're it's out of our hands is at the discretion of somebody else but a lot of what we do that's it, it, practically how it works and that's all I have Mr. Pack. Quick question. The situation that Jones Creek police officer testified about, the perpetrator was in Canada, right? Right. And I would imagine sometimes um, these crimes were perpetrated people by people outside of the state of Georgia. Do you know whether or not um, the state of Georgia or the DA's office would spend resources extraditing someone for a misdemeanor offense? No, I don't, but I I'm, I'm willing to bet that they don't spend money trying to bring somebody here for misdemeanor offense, especially the first one, without regard to how serious of a result that ended up, like the situation that uh, when the SWAT team and everybody came out. Um, so given that fact, we, are you still wanting the amendment to turning it into a misdemeanor? Well... Well, I don't think he ever said he wanted the amendment. <laughs> but you still consider it a friendly amendment. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's your bill. I think it's my bill, and uh, I'm ready for an up or down vote. Uh, it's it's gone through sub. We we did do revisions. I do appreciate the comments, uh, and I do uh, appreciate a couple things you said. Is um, uh, particularly um, uh, Representative Reeves is that a judge or a uh, prosecutor has discretion on would he even, you know, charge on this or would he find some another reason to do that. Uh, in this case, what we had is a person, you know, that sat on his computer, disguised where he's calling from, and he wasn't in this country. Uh, he's actually called the serial swatter, and there's an article in the New York Times about it. But it, it, it could have just as easily have been someone in Oregon, could have been someone in Tennessee, and then... Uh, and Someone like that needs to face justice because we've had people killed and uh, it's just, and it's been both sides. It's been a, a law um, an enforcement officer has been killed and then also an inno innocent civilian. It's, it's really highly dangerous. It's, uh, it's more than just the stuff that we used to do as teenagers uh, when we were 12 or 13 years old uh, and you know, silly stuff like that. This is endangers people's lives. Uh, it, the Johns Creek Police Department spent over 1,000 hours, you know, hunting this guy down. If a Detective Sergeant Finley wouldn't have been so um, uh, persistent and diligent in this, he spent over 1,000 hours, and somewhat that's that's a, a major cost there. And then when you call out uh, the SWAT teams, one of the things that uh, the police chief talked about in his testimony is that uh, Johns Creek, in that case, they're part of what's called uh, you know Chatcom 911, so they actually have SWAT members in the cities of Dunwoody, Chambly, uh, 
Sandy Springs and Johns Creek, and there may be one other. So it's a, it's a multi-police force jurisdiction that comes together. So there's also a cost involved. Um, so it's more than just a silly prank, and that's the heart of this bill. Mr. Sessler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to um, kind of explore in the, the, the discussion that Representative Hightower opens up. Um, and you know, I, I would share to the author my concerns about, you know, is there a – as you know, in this committee, we've got to look at all possible circumstances that meets the language. Um, you know, I, I don't doubt there's not a circumstance where someone does this that I'd like to see them spend 12 months behind bars. Uh, I don't doubt there's not a circumstance which, if there's substantial cost, they shouldn't have to make full compensation for any government costs that, that, are, that are involved, or if there's any subsequent damages of people that are harmed through this. I mean, that they start this chain of events, I think they, they should be financially responsible and, and, and so forth. I do struggle, though, um, you know, the notion that prosecutorial discretion is going to be what this is going to hang on. Um, you know, we, we owe justice to every person for the actions that they undertake. I'm concerned that if this is a felony and we, we, we're, going to, we're going to rely on prosecutorial discretion, there could be somebody that does this that's done bad things in their past. They may not be an attractive um, um, suspect. They may be quite unattractive. They may have done. They may have had a, a history as a juvenile. Juvenile offenses. They may be a high school dropout. They may be somebody that's not the picture perfect example of somebody we want to go easy on. The uh, the prosecution community could say this person is going to is going to get the full measure of the law dropped on them for a false alarm, because candidly they weren't they weren't the the, the straight A student who did this and all shucks you know we ought to just just be easy on them. Um, I believe people ought to be treated fairly before the law, and I'm concerned that if we, if we rely on prosecutorial discretion, we're going to live in a world where somebody that's got a spotted pass that does the exact same thing as the 3.7 GPA student um, is going to get this felony dropped on them, and the 3.7 GPA student who's going to the University of Georgia gets to, oh, shucks, shucks, it was, it was a fraternity prank, and it, we're going to employ prosecutorial discretion. That's my concern. That's really what, what Representative Hightower is speaking to. I think if we approach this from the standpoint of a high and aggravated misdemeanor, you can put some s significant uh, fines behind it. Um, I think we can explore, you know, civil r responsibility and penalties that, that allow, you know, uh, the, the Johns Creek Police, 911, and these folks to be compensated, whether it's restitution or direct payments. You know, there, there's a lot of ways we can get at that. I'm just concerned we can't hang on prosecutorial discretion. Um, and assume that's going to take care of business for us. Right. I think. Well, we'll have the opportunity to slug that out after a motion. But I mean, is there, there's no question. I'm sharing. I'm sharing the author of my concern. Okay. And uh, I, I think as we move on this and offer amendments, I wanted that context as background. Very well. Thank you, Mr. Hightower. I, I, I apologize for belaboring the point, but when you combine my concern with lines 38 and 39, they're just amplified. I mean, when, when, you, when you have Representative Trammell's concern that we are opening this up, and, and, and that's my concern is just, just amplified at that point. So, Thank you. I see no further questions from members of the committee. Is there anyone here in opposition to House Bill 790? Hearing none, and in light of uh, the various committee meetings that we've got going on this afternoon, I'm going to ask for the uh, what's the pleasure of the committee? Vice Chair moves due pass of HB 790 by substitute LC 296877S. Is there a second? Is there a second? Is there a second? Mr. Raffensperger, the, the motion fails today by virtue of the lack of a second. That does not mean that the bill is dead. It just means that it may need a little Tweaking. work in order to go ahead and, and get a motion in a second and to move on from there. Thank you for your time. So please understand that. That's fine. Okay. I'll be back. Thank you. Good. We'll uh, move on to uh, Chairman Sessler's House Bill 845. But thank you. Thank you, Mr. 
Chairman, members of the committee. Um, HB 845 uh, addresses an issue that I'd like to share briefly. I know we're constrained for time. I'll give, try to give a little background for it. Uh, what's being offered today, the LC version 296897S is actually a committee uh, substitute that takes uh, the recommendations of the subcommittee, adopted a couple word changes, and then that's what's being offered here before full committee. I'll explain those, those changes for the full committee. But what H HB 845 seeks to do is to provide a safe harbor for good faith reporting of child pornography. Uh, there was a circumstance in Cobb County, actually right in the border of mine in Representative Reeves' district, where there was a 14-year-old uh, young lady who took nude photos of herself and emailed them to an 18-year-old young man who's, who's in a college out of state. Well, the 18-year-old's mom still monitors social media and saw these photos and thought, oh my goodness, I can't believe what was sent to my son. Um, so the mom prints them off and goes to the, to the headmaster of the school and says, uh, these photos were sent to my son from one of your students. I, I would ask that you take, take, you know, take this into advisement and do something about it. Well, as soon as the school authorities who you know, looked at this and understood it, the young lady had been in trouble before. They went to the young lady's parents. And no sooner had they raised this to the, the uh, attention of the young lady's parents, the young lady's parents brought charges against the reporting mother for possession of child pornography because the possession of the material that she had to take it to the school to report it, um, she had to be in possession of it. And there is no, when we pass this and have passed these laws over the last five years, there's no safe harbor for good faith reporting of child pornography. So what HB 845 does is it provides a safe harbor provision for good faith reporting, and we've got some, some brackets around that, that if somebody promptly reports it either to law enforcement officials or to any entity that's required as a mandatory reporter, be it a school, um, a counselor, uh, other agent, defax agencies, if they're a mandatory reporter for child abuse and somebody in good faith takes this material to them, they have reasonable protections uh, in as much as they're op operating in good faith. And that's, that's what HB 845 does. Thank you. Questions from the committee for the author? Ms. Kendrick. I had a question about line 10. Um, and this is uh, a question as to the wording. It says any individual. Is there a reason not to include person to include uh, maybe organizations as well as individuals? Because under your scenario, could they still go back and sue the uh, organization? Well, they weren't, they weren't part of an organization, but had they been a part of an organization or maybe their employer, could they still have sued if you didn't include a uh, person, which includes like corporations and yeah. It's, it's a fair question. I, I did want to draw this more narrowly. Um, you know, perhaps there's protections that, a, that a, a corporate entity would want to have through this. I think because of the nature of this, it's not something that you take, you send it around the office and staff it around for a number of people to possess before you turn it in. I do think it's sort of the individual. Um, I think broadening it could have created un un unintended consequences that I wasn't looking to expand it to. I know individuals more narrow in terms of this, this safe harbor protection. So I'm comfortable with it being a little bit more narrow at this point. Um, I could be convinced otherwise, perhaps, but I do think the more narrow crafting of a safe harbor provision is per, maybe safer for us. So that, that was the approach. Any further questions for the author? Mr. Chairman, I would committee. highlight for the full committee just the, the changes we made, if I could just very briefly. On line 13, uh, there was discussion in subcommittee, um, uh, such possession for the purpose of, it used to say reporting such violation what the, at the recommendation of the prosecution community. We added a language to address that. We put promptly reporting. Didn't want to provide any hard, bright line, 24 hours, just based on the fact patterns being different, but promptly did I think tighten that a little bit to provide someone a requirement to, to, to be able to demonstrate that, to, to, to be able to qualify for the safe harbor. And then lastly, um, clarifying that's on line 15, to any person who's required to report. Again, uh, Representative Kendrick, person is, it could be an entity, it's not just an individual. Um, and then it's the, the, the pretty clear um, 1975 mandatory reporting entities. So there's, there's very clear about what those entities would be and would not be to whom you would report this. And the thinking here was we're trying to cover common sense behavior. 
Um, many folks who are involved in this aren't going to know the law, but they're going to do something that, that, that they think passes the common sense test. So if an individual goes to the school or if it's perhaps somebody that's, that's in a church youth group, they go to the pastor. Um, pastors are mandatory reporters. You know, if it's something said in the confessional, that's a different, that's a special car. This, this wouldn't apply to that. But whatever organization perhaps, you know, would be, would seem to make sense to somebody, um, but that also has the legal obligation to then report it up and not just sit on the information, we thought that was the, an appropriate addition to law enforcement. Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, to the author, I, uh, I missed the second <laughs> hearing on the, on the bill, and my, my apologies. The quickly... Um, I had, I have some concerns about promptly because you you have some equal protection problems. What what is kind of your idea? What what would be promptly? Because I could imagine you know, 24, 72 hours. But when when you start getting to a week, two weeks, because um, there's really not going to be any adjudication of what promptly is, except for I guess in the eyes of the prosecutor. Yeah. The same concern that you raise on the other bill. It's kind of um, I would actually prefer to see a specific time deadline. Would it be 72 hours or 48 hours? But I wasn't there at the subcommittee hearing, so what was the idea? It, it's a fair question. I appreciate the vice chair's uh, request. It was, I think there was some some sense in subcommittee that I think <coughs> on both sides of this, that if you create a bright line, there could be problems. Um, if there's if, if there's ideal language, that's got case law behind it in this kind of circumstance, I'm certainly open to it. We have tried to have it mirror other safe harbor provisions. I think the, the desire of the subcommittee, and I think from testimony, it formally said for the purpose of reporting such violation, that, that would have been legally sufficient, but I do think, again, further tightening that down to provide some duty on behalf of somebody who's trying to claim the safe harbor and get the protections to, to, to demonstrate they didn't sit on it for a week and they kind of got around to it whenever they, they could. Uh, I'm certainly obviously open for the discussion in the, in, in the will of the committee, but I do think that was something we tried to tighten down on it some without saying 24 hours. And, you know, and if it's something that you get and you think, oh, my gosh, I can't believe this, you talk to your spouse about this in the fact pattern of the mom, maybe it's 36 hours before we actually hand deliver it to somebody. Maybe you, you get it on a, on a Friday night and you take it Monday morning to the school. What's the, is, is there reasonableness in that? And I think it's highly fact pattern dependent. And I think the duty is certainly on the person to demonstrate promptness if they're going to avail themselves of the safe harbor. But I think, I think we do well to provide a little discretion in there for you know, for a court. The uh, what if the cop? This may have come up in subcommittee. What if the cop county mother? This arose in the situation arose from, you know, they they have it, but they don't know they have it. You know, maybe, you know, it, it could be. It's not necessarily electronic, correct? No, and I think that, that comes down to the, to the whole issue of the unread email. You know, I then think you've got that, you know how long is well. I didn't realize I had this, and it was a week later. And I think you can make a strong case if you don't know you had it and you hadn't opened the email. Mm -hmm. But I think as, as we unpack this in the minds of reasonable people acting in good faith, is there? I mean, I, th I draw the line when you, when you look at the, the the mandatory reporters. They have a twenty four hour window. Because they know they're mandatory reporters, they go through mandatory reporting training with their employees and their leadership. They're when, when you qualify as a 1975 mandatory reporter, it's you are a responsible entity that has a clear understanding of your responsibilities. A citizen that's acting in good faith doesn't have that clarity of understanding. So how do we? I mean, I would because I would tell you, 48, 24 hours to me for a regular citizen is not enough. But 72 hours for a regular citizen in certain circumstances seems perhaps too long. So how do you how do you get at it in a way that's recognizing there's gonna be a variety of fact patterns? I don't think the sit the private citizen needs to have the same crisp, clear reporting requirements that a, a known mandatory reporting entity does. So I'm I'm open to suggestions. Uh, well, I'm, I'm thinking about that, but let me call Mr. Spayhaus. Okay. Mr. Spayhaus, let me ask you to interject. Or anywhere, it doesn't matter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, we appreciate what's 
what's trying to be addressed here. We, we've got two concerns about it. One being the, the lack of, of clarity about how soon you should do something. And then again, I agree with the concept of when do you know you have it? Um, our suggested language, um, instead of the promptly, is to come in somewhere around li on ri line 11 after title and say, and immediately law en notifies law enforcement, but in no case later than 72 hours from the time there is reasonable cause to believe that they are in possession of such material or images. So it's, you should let somebody know you've got it if this is going to be your defense. There is an end to that, which is 72 hours, but it only starts when you re have reasonable cause to believe that you're in possession of it. And something along that nature, we believe, draws that because otherwise we're fearful that you will see this defense raised and that immediacy is when you realize you're fixing to be caught with it. Let and me ask for the author's reaction to that and then the vice chair. Yeah, I think um, the language of reasonable cause to know you're in possession of it would be, that'd be a welcome addition. I think it provides more clarity. I think, you know, and I think the, I'm not opposed to 72 hours in principle. What I, what I do have a real, con I, I would oppose that law enforcement's the only entity that you can report it to. Because I believe that there are people who are operating in good faith who come across something like this. Or the yeah. So, so if, if they're filing a manager reporter, that's... If, if ultimately you can deliver it to them, then notifying them would be sufficient. Just something, as soon as you've got it, you go, hmm, I need to tell somebody i got this, mm -hmm. and then I'll take it to them. Yeah, I'd be, you know, the reasonable um, knowledge that they're in possession of it in 72 hours would be fine if that's the will of the committee. I have no issue with that. I'd, and I would argue that perhaps faster than 72 hours would be better and maybe based on certain fact patterns appropriate, but I, if we want a bright line, then it's... I think you also have a catch-all defense if you actually intended to do that but didn't meet the 72 hours, you still have a defense to the underlying crime because you don't have mens rea. That's right. Yeah. So okay. that's probably better language. Mr. Tower. I was trying to cut it off. Okay. Let's do this. Um, that's, I don't see any other questions, members of the committee. This is more than a simple change. It's not a terribly complex change either. Let's just temporarily suspend consideration of that to keep the wheels turning. Let's hammer out some language while we're here privately. Offer it later today. And then we'll come back. We'll come right back. Okay. Okay? Good. Uh, Mr. Holcomb, you ready? Okay, let's do it. Uh, Mr. Holcomb has, Representative Holcomb has House Bill 827. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. It's my pleasure to present to you House Bill 827. This bill, uh, the purpose of this bill is to address the issue of untested rape kits and to provide a statewide system that will ensure the timely uh, transfer and processing of rape kits in the state of Georgia. I began working on this last year, and after uh, working on it, there was a well-published incident just here in Atlanta. Uh, approximately 1,500 rape kits were found sitting on shelves. Since that time, I've coordinated with law enforcement, in particular GBI, the sheriffs, chiefs of police, uh, prosecutors, and I believe you have in your packet letters uh, to that effect. And we've worked very hard to come up with a system that has the support of uh, all of those various stakeholders is supported by victims rights groups and also by the treatment community as well. Uh, I'll walk you through the bill. Uh, Section A uh, provides for the medical examination and 16-6-1 is, is the rape provision, 16-6-2 is the sodomy provision, so these are kits for uh, taken from the medical examination from either a rape or a sexual assault. Section B sets forth the new time period by which after a rape kit is taken, it needs to be uh, the entity that takes the kit, either the treatment provider or the hospital will notify law enforcement, and then law enforcement's obligation will be to come and retrieve the kit within 96 hours. Presently, we don't have anything in statute requiring that. Section C would then require law enforcement to transfer 
the kits to GBI within 30 days. In the subcommittee, we heard testimony that frequently the transfers only happen on a once a month basis. And so the 30 days is a period of time which was deemed to be reasonable and appropriate. Section D is to address what we believe will be uh, the backlog that will be identified by this process. And it requires all of the providers to move their kits to law enforcement by July 15th, and then the law enforcement will then have um, 30 days. They have to receive them by July 31st. They will have 30 days until August 31st to then transfer them to GBI. And GBI uh, has stated that August 31st then gives them enough time to make decisions with respect to budgeting for 2017. Section E uh, requires law enforcement that is shipping the kits to GBI to create a list, and this is just to ensure that we don't lose any. It is uh, an, an auditing function and one that, that is supported. Section F was recommended by the prosecutors, and that is we're putting in place here timeline provisions, not substantive evidentiary provisions, and so this would not impact the admissibility of evidence in any criminal prosecutions. And then Section G requires that GBI prepare a report, which they are willing to do, and this would be shared uh, with the General Assembly and others. And the purpose of that is to identify the total number of kits that are outstanding. So if we have to make any additional budget uh, allocations, uh, we can do so. We know that there are kits outstanding in my home county of DeKalb. I've been contacted by one of the hospitals who says that they have kits and that this legislation would be very helpful to move uh, those kits forward. Um, this bill does not require that the kits be tested. Instead, it requires that they be transferred to the GBI who will make that decision. In terms of funding costs, uh, since this does not require that all the kits be tested, and the rough estimate for kits to be tested is approximately $900, what we want to do by the Section G provision of the report is then be able to identify the number that we have. And then there are federal dollars available, and Georgia has already received a grant of $2 million to help with covering the cost of testing. And then there are nonprofit dollars and other sources by which the kits may be tested. Um, one other item that I'd like to highlight for you is in Section B, you'll notice that the language says in line 21, when the alleged victim has requested that law enforcement officials be notified. There are effectively two tracks by which the rape kits are processed. One is those where the victim immediately knows that she wants to pursue a prosecution. There are also kits that are known as Jane Doe kits, and those are situations where the victim has a rape kit taken because the timeliness of doing so but for compelling reasons, perhaps fear of her safety, she may want some time in order to work out whether or not to move forward with prosecution. And so what this bill does is it only provides for the forwarding of those for which the victim is seeking a criminal prosecution. What will need to happen next year, we've already started the discussion with the health care providers, would be to set a statute of limitations of time for them to hold the kits. And so then that would address the issues that we've seen in the news of some kits being held five or ten years. Uh, but that will be a next year question, but wanted to address that in case that was a concern for any of the members. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. We'll get a report from the subcommittee chair, Vice Chairman Pack. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this was a uh, Representative Holcomb put a lot of work into this, bringing all the interested party together. It was pretty smooth kind of sailing with all the language. Um, the important portion of this bill is actually setting the timeline um, by which the law enforcement office, uh, the LEO, have to pick up the rape kits because right now that probably is what's caused the backlog, the story that you mentioned. Uh, in addition to that, I think it addressed all the um, issues with respect to affecting the actual prosecution. Um, the, the hospital association uh, spoke at the uh, well, both of them spoke at the uh, subcommittee level, and they notified that uh, from the hospital level, they they report all non-emergency injuries. Anyhow, so this is not going to really impact their 
operations at all, and and they're they're in favor of this legislation. Thank you for that report. Questions for the author from members of the committee. Going once. Seeing none, is there anyone present uh, who was here in opposition to House Bill 827? Going twice. Seeing none, what's the pleasure of the committee? Ms. Ballinger moves due pass of HB 827 LC 29 6904S, second by the Vice Chair. Council, any late breaking issues? S seeing none. Are there any amendments? Seeing none. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the gentlelady's motion signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The ayes have. The motion is adopted. Thank you, Mr. Holcomb. Thank you. Council, are you, do you have the language or do you want some more time? Okay. Uh, Mr. Clark, are you here? There he is. Representative Clark is here on HB 847. Welcome. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you to the uh, c committee members. I bring before you today House Bill 847. And uh, it, it's a bill it's just bringing welfare fraud uh, in, uh, under, under Title 16. It's just moving it. And uh, when I was holding my committee uh, hearings on the uh, welfare fraud this past year, uh, the prosecuting attorney uh, counsel had asked for us to do this. And it's not changing anything um, on being able to prosecute. All it's doing is bringing more awareness. So say someone is doing fraud and they know it, hopefully it's going to make them think twice. And if a few people less were to do fraud, it's helping a few more people who are truly needy get help. So um, I definitely think it's, it's a great bill and it's something we need to, need to move through. Call on uh, the subcommittee chair for a report, Vice Chairman Peck. Um, this bill was uh, kind of rearranging the statute from Title 49 to Title 16, and during the uh, during the subcommittee hearing, there were discussions about the lack of kind of prosecution under the uh, under the statute resulted in a high level of abuse, and so the prosecuting attorneys council and the, I believe the district attorneys are focused on enforcing and, and protecting the public fisc. And the um, majority of the changes are just kind of clean up in language, um, changing um, to be consistent with the other code. Um, there was nobody who spoke in opposition, and the bill passed out unanimously. Mr. Spayos, did you yes, want to support? Yes, sir, I can. Um, <clears throat> it does exactly as, Mr. as Chairman Pack says. You see in there, for instance, we're removing references to stamp coupons that are no longer used. We've used a term that's more consistent with the way the um, services are actually provided. Um, we've cleaned up some of the definitions and put this more in line of what the criminal statutes normally look like. And, of course, consistent with what we've done with elder abuse and some other criminal provisions that are hidden in other parts of the code, we've moved it into 16, make it consistent with crime. I will tell you this. When I came into office in 2012, we, we had ceased all prosecution of these cases. In the past, they had been managed through the Prosecuting Attorneys Council and then routed out because of some problems with the way they had been done in the past. Um, so we went for a close to three-year period without any prosecution. And the DHS numbers say, tell us now, in just 2014, there were over 2,500 claims for intentional violations that did not get prosecuted as crimes. Those claims valued a little over $11.5 million to the state. Um, since then, we've, the program has been up right at a year. It took close to two years to get the program revamped and, and back where it makes sense and passed federal scrutiny. But since then, we've put together close to 200 cases that are being prosecuted. And understand now, we're not even looking at criminal prosecution until the fraud level reaches $5,000. So we're not talking about minor infractions and thefts from uh, these programs, but substantial programs. We've now prosecuted, the average prosec case that's received prosecution in this state during this program is $11,000 worth of fraud. We've done it in 37 of the 49 circuits, and the highest fraud was actually close to $40,000. So 
the program is back up and working. Um, in doing all that, we had an opportunity to present to the study committee just the need to bring this code into the proper place in code and to clean it up. And then you see all the references that have to be fixed because we move it. That's what sections four, five, six, seven, et cetera, are. And I'll field any questions. So lines 39 through 45 don't represent policy change. It's a shift in, in where it's being housed. Is that a correct statement? Yes, sir. Just what we've so done for clarity is, for the committee. We've, we've done this like we normally do, and we've defined certain terms that are consistent with the way the program works. Yeah. But but these, these knowingly and intentionally and these um, provisions in here, or, or you see where they're coming right out at line 32 and 33 and been rearranged in a proper format. Okay. Right. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Spayhouse? Seeing none, is there anyone present uh, in, here in opposition to House Bill 847 who'd like to be recognized? Seeing none, and there are no questions from the committee members, what's the pleasure of the committee? Mr. Coomer moves due pass of House Bill 847 LC 440015, second by Mr. Gravely. Are there any amendments? Seeing none, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the gentleman's motion signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to wear your uh, Star Spangled Banner suit. <laughs> oh, please don't. <laughs> So we'll um, we'll continue our uh, our consideration of uh, Chairman Sutler's House Bill 845. I think uh, I've got the signal from Council that we have now, but now I have it. Now I see a, not a not a completely confident look from across the table <laughs> and a head scratch. That's even worse. <laughs> Well, I think when we get to a motion, I just are you comfortable? Are, are you are, are are you where you need to be after a motion? Okay. So let me do this um, from what we picked off uh, picked up earlier. I know we were talking. Uh, uh, we're potentially at, at closure on the the language as it relates to, to promptly. Were there any other issues that members had? It? On um, on 845, I don't recall any, but Ms. Kendrick. Oh, I wanted to um, propose changing that individual language to person, and I believe the author doesn't have opposition to that, to make it consistent with the statute. Ms. Sherman, there's other parts of the, the, this whole um, um, article that's that's that uses person, so I think for consistency we'd mirror that. I'm, I'm friendly to that, Mr. Okay, Chair. we'll go ahead and, and consider that in the context of an amendment at the appropriate time. Thank you. Okay, what's the pleasure of the committee on HB 845? Motion recommend due pass by substitute. Mr. Trammell moves due, uh, due pass by substitute HB 845 LC 29 6897 S. Is there a second? Second, second by Ms. Ballinger. Are there, any, are there any amendments, Mr. Setzler? Mr. Chairman, I would like to offer an amendment that includes the, the Kendrick um, language of person on line 10. Um, and that addresses the, the promptly issue, tightening that up some, as uh, Mr. Spayas said. I don't know if we want to call this the Spayas Amendment, but I'll, we'll, we'll call it the Setzer Amendment today. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll, it'll be honorary. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, the vice chair just leaned over. We want to address individual on line nine, 
19 and lines in line 21. Yes, I thought that was part of the oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Person individual. Yeah. Okay. For sure. Is the committee comfortable with what council has read? Do what we need it reread? It's fine if we do. Let's do let's have it read one more time just to make sure. Picking up after title on line eleven. So it would be let me try to read it in a sentence form. Sure. Maybe that might make sense. Any person that in good faith has possession of materials or images that are in violation of Article Three of Chapter Twelve of this title that immediately notify law enforcement officials or any person who is required by code section nineteen seventy five to report such Pregnant child abuse, comma, or within 72 hours from the time there is reasonable cause to believe they are in possession of such materials or images, comma, shall be immune to the same extent as a law enforcement officer would be immune from criminal liability for such possession, period, and taking out the balance of the words through line 16. Okay. Any questions on the amendment? as a whole. Mr. Coomer. Kind of a technical question and maybe even grammatical, but going back to line 10, we say any person who in good faith has possession of materials or images that are in violation. If you say that are in violation, you, you're saying the images are in violation when in fact I think you want to say that the possession is in violation of the law. So you would say any person who in good faith has possession of materials or images in violation of Article 3. Wouldn't that be correct? Oh. That's on the record, right? <laughs> it's I'd like to announce my retirement. <laughs> I, think, I think history's just been made. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we can tread lightly on just on if as council drafts the amendment in the context of the substitute that will ultimately get a motion if grammatically there needs to be an adjustment I don't, don't think the committee will push back too hard Mr. Chairman I'm, I'm in, in spite of the way uh, it may come across I do like simplicity um, the, 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 the immediately or 72 hours <laughs> it, it took a minute for that one to sink That's in Mr. Chairman <laughs> That's that's insider joke for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, in our in our quest for simplicity, uh, Im immediately or within seventy two hours. How how is the immediately reports and then the seventy two hour window? How do how do those function together? Is I mean in. in Would it be simpler just to say if you within 72 hours report, or, or is there, is there, does it immediately provide some sense of immediacy which informs the policy statement that once you get it, you know it, you need to do something with it? Yeah. And okay. it because I think if you know if, if someone had had this material, you know, and the idea of promptly, immediately, that the, the, the thinking was, I don't want to create a safe harbor where someone can have it for 70 hours legally and they're okay. As long as it's been in my possession, it's been on my computer for for two days, I'm good to go. Then I got to get rid of it. I, I I don't want to create that circumstance. That let me let me suggest that. The, I think the reason why we're having this conversation, to Mr. Coomer's point as well, is that we just don't have it physically in front of us, and so we're worried about where certain commas are and what they relate back to. That being said, you know, if after somehow, if we get the draft and it's not meeting up exactly with what the membership um, thinks it is, thinks it's supposed to do, that can always be cured with a technical amendment on the floor, no problem, and it won't obviously have any substantive effect. Yeah, the 72 hours is also tied to the reasonable cause for the need. Mm -hmm. So there's that feature as well. Okay. I'm, I'm friendly to the immediately interest there. I, I just want to make sure we, we are. We yeah, it's immediately or <coughs> if they, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but if they don't know, then 72 hours, within 72 hours of them knowing where they, or where they should have known. Yeah, I, I do want to create a duty to do it promptly, mm -hmm. um, and then the person, if, if they hold it for forty hours, they they can demonstrate why forty eight hours was was the exercise of good judgment. Mm -hmm. Which gets back to the discussion of the subcommittee. We were 
we didn't define the time because we didn't want to create some safe harbor, but you know, just a sense of immediacy. I don't know this this article well enough to know what how it's prosecuted or what, what the if there's analogous language in other parts of the code. That I think we're in good shape on the amendment, and if for some reason we're not, again, we can cure easily. No, we can cure, cure easily on the floor. If there's, we look at it and say, no, that's not quite what we meant to say. Mr. Hightower. The, uh, the, the immediate or 72 hours, but no, but what was the term, would y'all say? I don't think so. the, the, only, the only thing that we addressed in the, sub, in the subcommittee that, that was concerning is, is we talked about the mom who got this. Right, and she goes, and she sees it, and as most parents will do, as my parents would have done, they go to their husband, or they go to their wife, because they get it that afternoon. It it affects their child, and they go home, and they show their wife or their husband. They go, what What do we do with this? What's going on? And they take 24 hours to figure out how this is going to affect their child or what they need to do with it, or what the repercussions are going to be. Because at the end of the day, these parents, as would be with me, the well-being of my child is going to be paramount. I'm going to try to secure and protect my child above all else on what I do, for the most part. But they're on the 72-hour clock at that point, correct? But it, that's that we need to look. That's my only concern is the immediate portion or 72 hours when they should have known. But it's, it seems as that's... Uh, and, and maybe it is because we're not seeing it, but that, that's my that's my hold up because the, I can clearly see what this is going to entail is the parents that want to report the right way. But most dutiful parents, it won't be immediately. It's going to be after they have just a slight bit of time to see what they need to do. And that's why when in subcommittee, that's really why we steered away from a clear time and we went with promptly so that we did give prosecutors a little bit of discretion to go, okay, yeah, this is what took place. Let's I understand it gets gray, but... L let me suggest this. L let me suggest that we take five minutes and print the amendment outside, and that way we can do a quick copy, have it all in front of us, and I think that'll, that'll go a long way toward um, comfort on the, um, on the language. Is that... Vice Chair. A quick question about the, the subcommittee. Um, as I read it, this is just the immunity provision. I'm, I'm wondering if the scenario that Mr. Uh, Representative Hightower brings up, whether or not that's covered at all under the violation of the underlying statute. Because mere possession, and there some other intent other than just mere possession of it? No, I mean, depending on the age of the child, mere possession. Yeah. Okay. It's a per se violation. All right. Yeah. And certainly distribution. Yeah. And, and the thinking here is to, again, I think I stated it before, is we're trying to understand what reasonable behavior is in people acting in good faith. What does that look like? And if people are acting in good faith, we want to make sure that that's covered under this umbrella um, without creating any kind of perverse incentives for people to be able to exploit this. So, I mean, what Representative Hightower described is precisely what actually happens in households when this kind of thing happens. Or if you're in a business context, you go to your business for, oh, my God, what, you know. Mr. Chairman, if I made that. That's why in the subcommittee, I know, I know prosecutors are, in, in, in are looking at wanting this clear rule, but on, on promptly, that's, I think that's, there's a distinction in giving prosecutorial discretion on promptly there and giving prosecutorial discretion in what we talked about earlier on Raffenberger's bill when we're dealing with felonies or not felonies and how people are treated evenly across the board. There is a clear distinction there. We were talking earlier about prosecutors have, okay, well, I'm going to charge, I have a felony here, but I may treat this one differently and put them in a pretrial program or this or that. That's a different type of discretion, I think, that Sets, uh, Representative Setzel was talking about. Here, we want them, the reason we went with promptly and not a bright line rule from the subcommittee is because we wanted to give them the discretion to look at this and, and use that prosecutorial discretion in a proper way to say, yeah, this mom who went and reported this other mom for doing the right thing, this is crazy. This should not be done. This mother was acting in an appropriate manner to report this the right way, and they could look at this and go, all right, well, it did take her four days, but what did she do in those four days? She didn't show anybody else. She showed her husband. They talked about it for 24 hours. It was over the weekend, so they got back to school on Monday, and then they reported it, and so now we're at 72 hours or, or four days. But they can look at that and go, well, this is pretty prompt. 
This happened Thursday night. She didn't see her husband until Friday night. Then it was the weekend. Now it's Monday. There, I mean, I'm, that, that was, that's my concern. When we have that bright line rule, I mean, we can't, we can't make, legislation can't be perfect. It can't, sometimes it can't be. We try to make it be, but in certain times, we just have to trust, and I, we have to trust the prosecutor is going to act the right way with what discretion we give. And I don't want some creep to be able to use 72 hours as a defense to say, I had this, and I was in the process of calling such and such, and I only had it for two days, and, you know, I, I don't know how that plays out. Because the promptly it gives them, they can look at it, and they can say, okay, 24 hours was too long here, or 48 hours, this was long enough. I actually go back to Chairman Pat's comment about the promptly, and, the, and when you use it to describe discretion, I don't really, if you're saying that it's Brian's discretion to say promptly is 24 hours, and my discretion, I say, is 48 hours, I do believe that's an equal protection issue, because that's two individuals similarly situated that get treated differently by law. I actually believe that promptly the way it's in here makes this a fact issue. I mean, I'm going to argue prompt is one thing, you're going to argue prompt is another, and the jury or the judge is going to have to decide it. So that's my concern is this is an immunity provision that will be exploited. I mean, understand that we're talking, I, I get you're talking about mom and dad trying to figure out what to do with the, the, the teenager that's got this image, but the, the individuals on the planet that deal in this kind of material will exploit this kind of thing once they are caught if it is not written narrowly enough that it's clear to cover the population of that. But you have no fear that, that in doing that, because please know I do not want to protect those people. I know. At all. Zero do I want to protect those people. I want to prosecute those people all the way. But in making this, we, we're, we're affecting everyone. You see no risk in the scenario that I've given you. I see two things in the scenario you've given me. Uh, a clear understanding of public policy that in that as soon as you realize what you've got, you need to do something with it, report it to somebody. The way we've written it, that gives you a minute to, to contemplate that and decide what that is. And I also think the other thing that was said about this crime is also about intent to possess. It's one thing to have it, but remember in any crime I've got to prove intent. And I don't think your parent in your case has got the criminal intent to possess this, this item even though they have it. They have it written into every, I mean, implied into every criminal statute, unless it's specified otherwise, I've always got to prove criminal intent. Well, they intended to have it the way it is. I mean, they intended to have it once they see it. Right. So, I mean, that intent's there. They can have it and they can take it and report it. Let me uh, break in for just a second, ask Chairman Setzler, now that we've had this conversation, how he thinks he may want to approach. Again, I think the, I don't have a strong sense you know, council and I sat and, and talked about this, and she probably can chuckle about some of the words I suggest we consider um, to, to try to get at this. Um, I don't believe it, that the current state of the law requires criminal. I, mean, I, I do believe it's a per se violation if you're in possession of something. I, I believe it's a it, talking to my law enforcement at home and our, our prosecutor at home that there's not a. Th this is not something that's that's just. That you can wave your hand and say, I don't intend to have this with any criminal intent, I'm okay. That, that this, this is an issue that needs to be addressed. So, I, I mean, I do think, think that's an important distinction to make. I, I understand. I'm, I'm talking, I'm sorry, I'm talking specifically about the amendment. Because um, we have the amendment on the floor. And the question is, do we want to, to Mr. Hightower's point and the, the question of fact statement that Mr. Spahas made, which resonated with me, which in my mind, supports the high tower position on how it would be enforced, which I think gives that wiggle room, if necessary, on a case-by-case -case basis. That's just my sense. Doesn't mean that it's right, but I want to know: we have the amendment on the floor right now. Do you want to continue on with that amendment, or would you rather recede back into the um, original language, given the conversation that we've had? And Mr. Coomer, I'm going to call you in just a second. I'm comfortable with, with, with the amendment as proposed, although I believe it's better to not define a timeline. I, I believe it's best, um, but I'm going to... It's your amendment, so... I, I understand. I, I think I'm... I think there's a practical question here. And I think the practical question is what is best for law enforcement to be able to prosecute people who are bad actors um, and 
while still providing the safe harbor I'm looking for. So to that extent, I'm willing to, to, to acknowledge mm -hmm. the law enforcement communities and prosecution communities' desire language, because mm -hmm. I don't want to create any kind of safe harbor. I think, I think their language provides the protection I'm looking for for people. Um, so, I, but, but what I don't want to do is I don't want to open the, the window for bad actors. So this is if the amendment, as it's phrased, is best for prosecuting bad actors who are trying to use this wrongly in court. I'd, I'd rather stay with the language that's proposed. I'm going to call on Mr. Coomer for his comment, and then I'm going to ask counsel to reread the amendment, presuming we continue on with consideration of the amendment, Mr. Coomer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, just following on, on on the discussion we're having. I, I was going to make the point, I will, con will echo the point that really what we're doing is not just giving discretion to prosecutors, we're giving discretion to juries and judges, which I think is appropriate. We, we have juries and judges for this purpose, to find fact and apply the law to that set of facts. So <clears throat> it seems to me that, that the, the more flexible language is better as a public policy matter. And I say this as a person who was prosecuting child pornography cases 10 years ago, and I can tell you, when, when you have a child pornography prosecution, you don't have a prosecution for a single image. You have a prosecution for thousands of images. So getting over that intent threshold should be a problem if you're talking about somebody with one image. It should not be a problem in your standard child pornography prosecution where you're, you're dealing with somebody's hard drive with thousands of images on it. Okay. So what? So I would... And I don't know what, what the amendment is or not, but I, I prefer the, you know, my personal perspective from policy uh, position is that the, the uh, language does not set out a bright line time period, but instead says promptly or reasonably prompt or whatever that language is. Okay. And, and we're going to have the preferred. opportunity to, to have a vote on that threshold, which direction we go on. That language is being copied. I wasn't comfortable with our just going on memory on that, given the, the subject matter. That's being copied. I'll call the vice chair. We'll uh, go from there. One question related to the language and the amendment. To follow up on um, Chairman Coomer's comment, um, this appears to be granting an immunity, so it's not really a defense issue at trial, but it's the charging issue, right? right? That's why I thought maybe something specific that defines what good faith term is might be better for direction for the DA's office because we have discretion, a lot of a lot of DAs might have a different definition of what promptly means, and so um, I, I mean I think I think Chairman Coomer's point is very very poignant. I, I asked whether or not because it's an immunity, that situation is a little bit different from what Chairman Coomer uh, wants to address. Well, still got to be raised, but I'm going to I think the, the reality for us is, on a practical standpoint, is that you have to realize that we're creating the immunity right now. As it stands right now, possession is illegal. Now, God help us if there's a prosecutor who's willing to prosecute the mother, but that needs to be corrected. The fact is, what we've done, if we go with the word promptly, because it has such wide interpretation, is we are going to create an issue that's going to be litigated in every single case. With all due respect to what's been done, I mean, I, I'm running an office that's prosecuting this stuff right now, today. We do have cases that involve thousands of images. We have cases that involve 10 or less. With your ability to download thousands of images almost instantaneously, you can only imagine, and, and I deal with defendants who have become very crafty, you can only imagine their ability to re-download images every so often and try to argue this type of nonsense. For us, what I think we need to do is recognize the fact that this is a parent who's trying to help and someone who's trying to help a situation, but to leave it completely open-ended means that a defense attorney is going to do their job and argue that promptly means one thing, a week, two weeks. I'm going to do my job as a prosecutor, not dealing with a parent. That's where I'm going to use my discretion and say, hold up, I don't care if it's, you know, twice 72 hours. If, if I'm convinced that this is a parent trying to help, I'm not prosecuting them, and nobody in my office is going to prosecute them. But what we have to prevent is creating some type of built-in defense that's going to add to what a defendant may argue. And this is what the word promptly is going to do practically for us, meaning that we're going to have to try these issues and litigate them, where a defense is going to say, hey, it was prompt. It was within a week or two. Maybe he worked. Maybe he wasn't on his computer very often. And we're going to say, absolutely not. He's looking for child pornography. These are just issues that we have to litigate every day. So we have realistically created, if we do this, um, this argument that 
whoever downloads these images or has these images, that's the point that they have reason to know that they have child pornography. So that's when the period begins. Mm -hmm. Defendants will argue that. It's just a fact. It's what they're going to do. So we do have that. I think it's good to give some type of window to say, hey, immediate or no later than 72 hours. We have done that in the statute itself when it comes to do with individuals who are processing these images. A person who in the course of processing or producing visual or printed material either privately or commercially has reasonable cause to believe that the visual or printed material submitted is child pornography, they make a report immediately to the GBI. You need more time than immediately for exactly what Representative Hightower expressed. This is going to impact your family, your children. That's going to be your first concern. But I think we do have to put some ceiling on that to say, if you can't get that done within 72 hours, presumably, hopefully, you've dealt with your child, you've been able to talk to an attorney, which would be advisable. That's what I'd be doing if I had, I have twin boys who are 10 years old. In a few years, we're going to be dealing with this. So I think we do need more clarity from the legislation as what, from legislators as to what you're really seeing and anticipating for this. Because if we just leave it promptly, the reality is it's just an issue that we're going to litigate. So if y'all are okay with us litigating that issue, it does have the impact of adding something else the defense can argue. I think 72 hours will be better because clarity is always better to me when you're dealing with the people. Giving them clarity in what's expected of them is always better in my opinion. Or we're going to litigate just like we do reasonable and all of those types of Thank you, Mr. Fortman. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Tramble, no, Mr. not at all. I appreciate your input on it. Uh, Mr. Tramble, I'm going to give you the last word and then we'll go to a vote. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I think you're always going to have the issue, you're always going to be litigating this issue. So it doesn't matter whether you use the word promptly or whether you use 72 hours or whether you use the word immediately because the defense will raise the justification and then the question will be whether the justification is applicable. <coughs> so I think it's just the policy determination about what we're the most comfortable with. All right, Mr. Setzler. We have the Setzler Amendment on the floor. You have the copy of the amendment right in front of you. Uh, let me ask counsel again. Well, we've got, I assume everybody can read that, the photocopy quality. So, uh, Mr. Setzler, why don't you go ahead and just repeat the amendment as we've got it here. Again, Mr. Setzler, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, we'd be striking individual on line 10 and in I'm sorry, we'd be striking individual who and inserting person that. And then we'd be uh, striking that R, which is the uh, the Coomer edition. Um, and then inserting after title on line 11, uh, that immediately notify law enforcement officials or in writing, sorry, or, or, or within 72 hours from the time there's reasonable cause to believe they're in possession of such materials or images, comma, shall be immune to the same extent uh, as a law enforcement officer and so forth. Uh, and then the appropriate strikes on line 14 through 16, and then inserting person that in place of an individual who throughout the um, code section. And again, Mr. Chairman, I, I, my, my intent here is is to put in law a, a safe harbor that someone can argue. I do think Chair, Vice Chairman Pack's point was, was valid in terms of this is charging, this isn't necessarily um, only what's going to be before a jury, and I think I think putting this in code allows someone, perhaps if they took in good faith beyond 72 hours, it allows them to make the case in court, hey, I was doing the right thing, and perhaps, you know, get get consideration. But I do think I'd, I'd, I want to err on the side of law enforcement being able to bring charges against bad actors you're trying to use this. I think that's that's the, the way we would best err. Counsel, did you have comment on that? You look. Yes, I'm sorry. I got it. Is that clear to the committee? Is the, does the committee have a clear roadmap on the on the amendment? So again, the effect of Mr. Chairman is that if the individual reports it to law enforcement or to a mandatory reporter immediately or within seven, not longer than 72 hours, they're covered. They've done their duty, and then the the mandatory reporter then has 24 hours to turn that in. Okay. On the Setzler Amendment, all those in favor signify by, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? No. In the opinion of the, eye, uh, opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, but let's have a hand vote on the Setzler Amendment. Please uh, all those in favor, please signify by uh, raising your hand. 
five. Opposed? And the motion is adopted. Are there any further amendments? Seeing none on the underlying motion of do pass by substitute of HB 845, again by substitute, incorporating the amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have and the motion is adopted. Thank you for the discussion. Uh, we'll be adjourned. We're in recess on Monday. So the next regular, I'm sorry, we are going to have a hearing on Friday. We're going to take, um, it'll be just Friday morning. Yes, sir. We, we do have subcommittee two hearing right after this. We're taking up seven. Settler subcommittee right after this meeting. We are going to have a hearing, and it's hearing only on Friday, of two bills. One is 722 to hear from, uh, the, from the law enforcement community. On House Bill 72, that's the medical marijuana bill. And we're also going to have a hearing only on House Bill 941, which is uh, the grand jury bill on uh, uh, fatality and uh, serious injury as a result of uh, police shooting. Again, that's Friday. That will be hearing both hearing only. I understand it's Friday of a long weekend. If you can be there, uh, please make every effort. Uh, but I understand what kind of weekend it is. It'll probably be at nine from 9:30 until noon, no later than noon. So that uh, Mr. Atwood, <laughs> Friday, thank you. But if you want to come Saturday, <laughs> you can. I, I promised Mr. Atwood that we would end by noon so that he could be home for dinner. So thank you very much uh, for your time today. We're adjourned.